All right, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. Um, it is 2024, and this is a talk on cold fusion at B-Sides. Uh, so that, to jump right in, just a, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been doing security work for uh, a bunch of years now, uh, long-term focus on application security for about the past 15 years or so, working with product teams to build secure products, uh, a lot of web app testing, a lot of mobile testing, uh, a little bit of client server, a little bit of hardware, a little bit of legacy stuff. And so um, early on in my career, I spent a lot of time uh, working in higher ed. After that, I was supporting state and local government for a number of years. So uh, if anyone in the, in the audience has worked in those uh, industries, uh, I know a lot of the challenges, I know a lot of the pain points, and uh, feel free to come chat about uh, it after the talk with me too. Uh, more recently, most of my experience has been in financial services and uh, in uh, various tech companies as large as Fortune 10 to uh, as small as under 100 people. Um, I'll also, also say from the outset, I am far from a cold fusion expert, but it's a technology that I've seen uh, pretty much spanning my entire career going back to about 97 or so. Uh, again, in lots of those verticals that I've mentioned, um, even today, uh, I, I still see cold fusion applications from, from time to time. Uh, and also, just to get this out of the way too, uh, yes, I've seen the memes too. Uh, cold fusion has a history. Uh, cold fusion has a reputation. It, it may not be the, the sleekest tech or the newest tech or the hottest tech. Uh, it's still around. It's still security relevant, uh, which, which is why I'm chatting about it today. All right. so. Uh, this talk really kind of came about uh, from two to three years worth of, of cold fusion research that I was doing. And during that time, there were a string of uh, critical and high impact uh, cold fusion vulnerabilities, uh, some of which I reported to Adobe, some of which other people reported to Adobe. And I, I kind of took a step back and, and thought, is there anything that we can learn from these vulnerabilities in terms of how they're being exploited? where they live, um, really just to think about, can we, we look at uh, what's been seen in the past and predict um, how might the next one be exploited? Or where might the next one exist? Or proactively, can we do something to put controls in place and think defensively and, and break future exploits before the next vulnerability is, is, is found? Um, I'll, I'll also want to add uh, one motivation for this talk was that it's been about 15 years since the last great cold fusion talk that I saw at a security conference. Uh, that was back, or I think uh, 2010, uh, Chris Ang and Brendan Creighton from Veracode uh, gave their talk, uh, Deconstructing Cold Fusion. Uh, slides and video are online. That talk goes into uh, a lot more about the cold fusion runtime and cold fusion execution uh, that I'm going to talk about today. So certainly, if you're interested in cold fusion and haven't looked up that, that talk, uh, it's, it's certainly Highly recommended. All right, so um, even today, um, like I said, cold fusion is out there. This is um, kind of cliche, but this is a Google, Google search that I did a couple weeks back. Google showed that there were uh, more than 64 million uh, potential cold fusion pages out on the internet. So it's certainly technology that's still in use. Uh, this is certainly just a, a rough back of hand metric. It's not perfect. It's going to miss things. Uh, there's lots of cold fusion applications that are going to be internal only or internet applications. Uh, there's ways that you can build cold fusion applications that this kind of search may not pick up on. But if nothing else, it shows you, yes, cold fusion is still out there in 2024. Uh, some more metrics for today. Uh, cold fusion is, is still very heavily used across uh, all levels of the government. So federal, state, and local, it's out there. Uh, it's also surprisingly still out there in the private sector. And, and while many sites won't be running there at their main dub 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 on cold fusion or, or high profile web properties, uh, they may have legacy applications, they may have niche applications, uh, they may have internal or internet applications like I mentioned, or they may be working with third party providers, uh, small vendors uh, who again are, are providing their services uh, through uh, cold fusion applications, either new or, or legacy. Um, cold fusion is also still in scope for the uh, Trend Micro Zero Day initiative. Uh, 
Uh, so um, in uh, 2023, there was one vuln reported through ZDI and 11 vulnerabilities reported in 2022. Uh, and also in 2023, uh, we saw multiple zero day vulnerabilities in cold fusion uh, detected and, and fixed in the wild. And, and so those, those last two metrics show you, you have security researchers today still actively looking at cold fusion. Uh, and then you also have attackers who are looking for zero days and exploiting zero days in the wild, uh, looking at cold fusion as well. Uh, cold fusion also still continues to make headlines. And a lot of times these headlines are going to be security related, uh, whether it's a recent compromise, an old compromise, um, vulnerabilities used in ransomware kits. And one thing that's, that's significant was that uh, even now, a lot of cold fusion vulnerabilities seem to have very long tails. So vulnerabilities that are decades old may still exist on the internet today and lead to compromises, lead to ransoms, and lead to, to either high impact or high profile breaches. Okay, so um, I mentioned a couple of cold fusion zero days in, in 2023. Uh, March of uh, 23 was, was busy. Um, this particular Adobe Security Bulletin had uh, two zero days uh, that were both patched. Uh, one was a local file include uh, that was actually um, pretty involved and involved um, sending in some, some code that was written to an error file that was then uh, read back and could lead to uh, remote code execution. Uh, and then also at the same time, uh, there was a uh, Java deserialization flaw that could lead to uh, remote code execution as well. Uh, this was initially patched in March, and then subsequently there were uh, multiple variants that were found, uh, basically bypasses of the patch and then future bypasses of, of later patches. Uh, and I'll, I'll be going to some more detail about some of these. Um, but before I talk about the vulnerabilities, just want to really touch on cold fusion history in case folks may not be familiar. Uh, it's a web development language initially released by Allaire back in 1995. Uh, it was rewritten in Java. Uh, initially, it was C and C++. Uh, rewritten in Java in 2002 with the release of Cold Fusion 6, uh, and then acquired by Adobe in 2005. Um, besides the commercial Adobe Cold Fusion, uh, there are alternate uh, CFML uh, engines. Um, so currently today, there's the, the actively maintained Lucy open source engine. Uh, and then historically, uh, there's been uh, Raylo, uh, OpenBD, uh, which are, are two open source projects that are no, no longer actively maintained. Uh, and then also Blue Dragon, which was a, a former uh, commercial uh, cold fusion engine as well. Okay, so uh, to look at the, the tech overview quick, uh, cold fusion code can be written in two different ways. Uh, one is the, the legacy tag based, which looks almost like HTML, except it's, it's run and evaluated server side. Uh, and then also the, the more modern CF scripts that'll look like uh, any script based language, so your, your JavaScript or, or anything else. Um, cold fusion as a language also has had a lot of backwards compatibility which is great in terms of, of uh, letting applications continue to run. Um, but from a security standpoint, there's never been that, that big uplift from, let's say, like a, a classic ASP to an ASP.NET, where there were lots of security guardrails, lots of breaking changes. And, and basically today, you can have the, the latest fully patched cold fusion environment, but your old vulnerable custom code from 20 years ago can still run in that environment. So your, your, your platform may be secure, but your code can still be insecure. Um, and so just to, to, to kind of take a look at those, those two, uh, two styles, uh, we can see some, some tag-based and some script-based. These basically just, just print hello. And so uh, when this is actually compiled, this is compiled into to Java bytecode. Uh, when we look at uh, a class file that's compiled, we, we can uh, let's say, just do a hex dump and see, yes, this is actually a, a Java uh, class file. And then being Java means that uh, it's going to be pretty easily uh, to uh, decompile. So we can go from CFML to compile Java back to some approximation of, of what the original native Java uh, might look like. Okay, so let's, let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about attack surface. 
So when, when we're talking about attack surface, we mean uh, all the inputs, all the areas that uh, an attacker may use uh, to either access or, or exploit a system. And, and when we're looking to reduce our attack surface, we can do things, we can harden the system, we can uh, make sure we have good access control, uh, we can turn off unnecessary stuff, and, and really just kind of build security in, think about what can we do to either uh, break attacks, break known exploits, break uh, exploit patterns, and, and things like that. Okay, uh, in terms of what we're gonna talk about today, there's, there's three main categories. Uh, first one is gonna be uh, admin interfaces. Uh, the second one is going to be uh, remote cold fusion methods. Uh, and then finally, a little bit about server-side request forgery. And, and so with that said, there's going to be a lot of attack surface that's going to be out of scope for today. Um, like any other web language, uh, web application security vulnerabilities can apply to cold fusion. So uh, your custom code, you need to worry about things like the OWASP type 10, uh, cross site scripting, SQL injection, log logic flaws, basically anything regardless of, of whatever language or framework you're using, uh, it would apply to cold fusion as well. Um, I'm also not going to talk about every single cold fusion vulnerability. I'm going to use a couple of examples, but certainly uh, there's a long history and uh, uh, lots more uh, vulnerability data that, that I'm, I'm not going to go into great detail about. Um, I'm also primarily focused on things that would be vulnerable or exploitable with a, a default install and something that an external attacker would be able to exploit. So things like uh, internal services or uh, services or configurations that may be turned off by default um, are going to be out of scope. And then certainly when, when you look at a, a whole application environment, you're going to have a lot more than just your custom code and your application engine. So um, the full attack surface would be platform vulnerabilities, network vulnerabilities, and uh, database, and, and basically kind of everything that, that, that makes your application go. We're, we're pretty much just narrowly focused on uh, cold fusion engine issues. Okay, so let's, let's dive in uh, admin interfaces too. So uh, the cold fusion administrator, just like any admin interface, is, is going to be sensitive. Uh, so whether it's a web interface, whether it's a, a piece of hardware, you want to protect access to it because it can lead to uh, sensitive functionality if, if an attacker was able to, to gain um, unauthorized access. Uh, so for cold fusion, CF admin is a, a web interface uh, used to uh, manage the environment. Besides the web interface, there's also an admin API uh, with a number of uh, endpoints. Um, CF admin comes with a lot of, of built-in and, and native code. So if you do a, a standard install, you're going to get CF admin, you're going to get uh, a, a lot of stock co code. So um, since CF admin has had a, a history of vulnerabilities, your custom code can be perfect and vulnerability free, but that, that default image may come with uh, built-in vulnerabilities or, or risks that you're, you're, you're going to want to keep in mind. Uh, and then finally, like, like I said, admin interfaces being uh, sensitive, you are um, going to want to protect them because if they get compromised, an attacker can bootstrap access, uh, they can elevate their privileges, they may be able to, to live off the land, pivot, or, or do more things from that uh, privilege vantage point. Uh, when we talk about CF admin, uh, typically it's going to be accessible via URLs uh, that start with CFIDE administrator or CFIDE uh, admin API. And then just kind of bottom line, uh, it's, it's something that you're going to want to access uh, restrict. Okay, so if folks have done cold fusion pen tests in the past or looked at cold fusion, uh, this may look familiar. Uh, this is what the, the login page of CF admin is, is going to look like. And so um, oftentimes, if you can get here, that means you're going to have accessible vulnerabilities. If nothing else, you can try and brute force usernames and passwords, which, which may get you in. Um, but beyond that, being able to see this page means you're going to be able to interact with uh, API endpoints and components and, and things that, that again, uh, may be useful in, in a, a high-impact exploit chain. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit about how Cold Fusion may typically be, be set up. Um, this is definitely one of the more common deployments, but not the only way to, 
deploy it. Uh, Cold Fusion being a huge uh, Java application could be deployed uh, basically any way that you're, you're going to deploy Java servlets. But a lot of times, you're going to have an external web server uh, connected to Cold Fusion via a, a connector, so something like an IIS, uh, ISAPI filter, or a, a Tomcat connector. Um, and so that on the back end will talk to an, an internal uh, Cold Fusion server. That will typically run on port 8500. Uh, that usually isn't exposed to the internet, shouldn't be exposed to the internet, uh, short end, prove me right or, or prove me wrong. Um, but typically, when you're interacting with a, a Cold Fusion environment, you're going to be talking to the external web server. And that connector is going to be configured to um, basically pass some requests onto the Cold Fusion environment and handle some requests locally. So if you request an image, your external web server is going to handle that. If you request Cold Fusion code, the Cold Fusion server is going to get that through the connector, and uh, those pieces are, are, are going to be uh, accessed. Uh, beyond that, you can also configure uh, trusted IP addresses, and there's uh, some built-in functions that, that will basically do access control checks um, for those trusted IP addresses. Um, and from like a, a typical point of view, between the connector configurations and between those, those IP address restrictions, this is how it's supposed to work. So if you're on the outside and you request uh, Cold Fusion Administrator, uh, you're going to get some kind of error. So it's either going to be not found, it's going to be forbidden, or just somehow isn't going to be accessible. Um, in reality, it's typically going to look more like something like this. So uh, there have been a history of bypasses. There have been a history, history of ways. Again, access control is, is really, really tough to get right 100% of the time. Uh, CF admin is, is no different. And often, um, being able to access vulnerable components or uh, vulnerable functionality starts with something as simple as an access control bypass. Okay, so looking at some potential uh, access control bypasses, uh, these have all been fixed at this point, um, but uh, recently, so like on, on a Windows environment, just being able to, to suffix your CFIDE path with a, a trailing dot uh, on Windows would, would bypass a lot of the built-in access control, but because of how an external web server and the connector and the Cold Fusion server would process that, um, that would be a way to, to, to bypass some of that initial access control. And so while you still wouldn't be authenticated, you from the internet might be able to, to get in. Um, and then from here, uh, you can uh, modify that different ways, so things like mixed case and, and other variations there. Um, and then finally, so the, 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 the top ones are all mine and, and things that I'd reported and, and have gotten fixed. Um, these are all fixed as of a, a, a fairly recent Cold Fusion update. Uh, and then the, the bottom one, again, we, we, we can see uh, a directory traversal uh, pattern. Yeah. All right. Um, which uh, was reported by Stephen Fewer of Rabbit 7, uh, and then fixed uh, back in uh, 2023. Okay, so when, when we think about uh, access control defensively, um, here we need to do much more than just patch. Uh, a lot of times to lock down an environment, you're going to need to uh, update your cold fusion components, update your connectors. Um, access control, again, can be really, really tricky to, to, to get right. Um, and so you also want to add trusted IP addresses into uh, Cold Fusion Administrator. Uh, if you're looking at this offensively, think about all the ways that you commonly bypass uh, uh, access control or a WAF rule. So URL obfuscation and uh, URL modification. Simple modifications can often bypass uh, access controls that, that may be out there. Uh, and then, like, like I said, a lot of times, a successful exploit chain starts with a fairly simple uh, access control bypass. OK. Uh, moving on to remote Cold Fusion components. Uh, Cold Fusion components are uh, files with a CFC extension that contain Cold Fusion data and functions. Um, 
similar to, to Java methods, uh, cold fusion functions are going to have an access contribute attribute that control how that can be accessed. So uh, you can set them up so that only other cold fusion uh, uh, code can, can call your functions, but you can also build remote functions, which are almost like simple API endpoints that can be called via a, a URL request. Um, and so um, one important thing to note is that there's different code paths for how uh, CFM, so your, your standard cold fusion files get uh, processed and how your, your cold fusion components get processed if they're called via a URL, uh, different servlets, and the, the servlet that processes uh, cold fusion components uh, is a little more complicated and, and has had a history of, of exploitable vulnerabilities just in terms of, of what that code path looks like versus if, if you're calling uh, static cold fusion files. Um, and like I said, there's, there's a lot of uh, cold fusion components included with a, a default cold fusion install in CF admin and in uh, other places. Uh, if we look at what one of these might look like in uh, either uh, tag-based syntax or script-based syntax. So we have a, a simple function. It takes two arguments, concatenates them together, and returns that value. Um, we can access it via a URL where we're giving it the, the function name, the, the method name, and then our arguments, and it, it returns our value. Um, but beyond doing it this way, um, we can also pass in all of our arguments at once in a, a parameter called argument collection. And, and so that can get passed in either as a JSON object or a, a WDDX uh, packet, which is just um, uh, an XML-like data structure. And, and so going back to our other example, instead of passing all of our arguments in individually, here we can see we're passing them in either as JSON or as uh, WDDX. And again, same, same output, same, same functionality, uh, and then just processed by those, those backend components. The downside, though, is that remote CFCs can lead to, to some dangerous places. So looking at past vulnerabilities, it's led to uh, XML external entities attack. It's led to Java deserialization attacks. Uh, and it's also led to, to mass assignments. And, and so we're, we're going to dive into some of these. But really, the biggest takeaway is that defensively, if, if you're not actively using remote components, um, you may want to just block access, block remote access to, to CFC files because that'll take a whole class of, of vulnerabilities uh, off the table for, for, for your environment and may protect you for uh, uh, a future vulnerability that, that isn't known, isn't patched yet, uh, but you'll, you'll proactively have some level of, of defense uh, and then to flip the table on the uh, offensive side, a lot of times if you're going to exploit one of these vulnerabilities, all you need to do is find one single uh, CFC file. It, it doesn't even, in a lot of cases, need to have a, a specific vulnerability. It just needs to be any uh, CFC file with a, a, a remote function in it. Uh, but looking at some of these examples, so this is going back a little uh, historically. Um, but it's, it's something that was never written up. And when I was looking at, at some cold fusion internals, um, I found it long after it had been patched. So it was patched back in 2017. Um, but I, I saw in the code what looked like an XXE uh, prevention method. And so that got me thinking, hmm, I wonder when that went in and was, was this code path vulnerable before it was patched? It, it turned out it was. and uh, from an exploitable standpoint, all you needed to do was be able to call any CFC file. Um, it didn't even have to have uh, cold fusion code in it. So a blank file with a CFC extension called via a URL would be enough to trigger this XXE vulnerability, um, which, which was interesting because it, it kind of raises interesting attack chains where even if there's not vulnerable code, if I can create a file on a server, I might be able to create this, this vulnerable condition. Um, and when, when we look at, at what the attack would, would potentially look like, again, a, a pretty classic XXE attack, where within that, that XML-like uh, WDDX packet, we're, we're passing in uh, a classic uh, XXE payload. Uh, that gets, gets processed. 
And and so I thought, well, hmm, I, I wonder, like, had this been um, uh, either talked about or, or, or written up in, in, in detail initially, like, would it have preemptively made people think, well, hmm, there's, there's a large attack surface on remote cold fusion components and, and maybe blocking access to, to CFC files is, is a good proactive security step if, if you're not actively using them. Um, moving on to Java deserialization vulnerabilities. So uh, these aren't unique to, to cold fusion and, and deserialization flaws in general aren't even unique to Java, um, but it occurs when uh, an application is going to deserialize untrusted data. Uh, it can lead to remote code execution. And uh, historically, cold fusion, like lots of other Java applications, has had a, a history of these. And so um, this was one of the, the initial zero days that I talked about. This was uh, one example that was uh, initially found uh, and, and patched in March of 2023 as a, a deserialization zero day um, and over time was patched, bypasses were found, patched again, more bypasses were, were, were found. And this, this is definitely through no fault of, of Adobe, root cause analysis is tough, uh, vulnerability patching is, is tough too in terms of getting it right and, and not breaking your environment but still providing adequate protection. But kind of there, there, there were a series of these in that, that, that middle part where it was patch, patch, patch. That, that was one of those, those initial kickoff points where I thought proactively, are there things that we can learn about how these vulnerabilities get exploited or where they live, where we can either predict where the next one might be or put controls in place. And, and so when, when we look at what exploitation looks like for these vulnerabilities, this, this was the first one. And, and so again, kind of similar to our, our XXE vulnerability, um, instead of passing in uh, XXE payloads, uh, we're passing in a deserialization payload. But again, similarly, we just need to be able to access any remote CFC method. Uh, we pass in our serialized uh, payload and a, a WDDX packet through our argument collection variable. Uh, so this was March. Uh, four months later, uh, another variant was, was patched and between exploitation of the first one to the second one, uh, it was just a matter of, of using a different uh, uh, Java class as uh, the payload within the, the serialization uh, object. Um, after that, there was another bypass. Uh, and this, this primarily, this, this again, same kind of thing, uh, find another uh, uh, class that we're able to, to pass in the payload. Uh, after this one, there was another variant where um, the, the way that, that uh, the payloads were, were being validated, uh, that block list was able to, to be bypassed. But through all these variants, it had the commonality of I'm interacting with a cold fusion component with a remote method and passing in some kind of data through, through argument collection. Uh, and then finally, um, Four months after the, the, the last one was, was patched, yet another bypass was found. And again, um, it was just a matter of, of finding more uh, uh, Java classes that could be used for the, the serialized payload. Um, but across all these vulnerabilities, there was a lot of commonality uh, where I thought, if you're able to, to block CFC files, for example, proactively, or block requests that had uh, the argument collection proactively, if you're not actively using that, that would have blocked uh, the vulnerability plus one or plus two or plus three. All right, so uh, again, to, to recap, in all those examples, we saw that exploitable functionality would be uh, reached just through any remote CFC method, uh, similar to other vulnerabilities that we saw. Uh, there was a lot of uh, overlap. And, and so again, a, a defensive approach like blocking these uh, would have prevented uh, future exploitation of vulnerabilities before they were disclosed, before they were patched, and, and uh, would be something for environments to, to give themselves a little bit of, of extra protection. All right, uh, moving on to the, the third category for uh, vulnerabilities we're talking about, cold fusion components, uh, mass assignment. So mass assignment's gonna occur when 
an attacker is able to uh, control values or objects that they, they shouldn't be able to control. Uh, so uh, if you think about it, if this is a variable or an object that is security relevant or used in a sensitive uh, operation, it, it may be the, the kind of thing that an attacker can break program flow or break assumptions if they're able to control sensitive data. Um, mass assignment is not unique to, to cold fusion. Uh, there have been mass assignment vulnerabilities in Ruby, in ASP, uh, in Node, and, and other languages as well. Um, but this particular cold fusion vulnerability, vulnerability was fixed uh, last November. Uh, for the most part, there's, there's some small edge cases that I'll talk about. Um, but before I talk about the, the mass assignment vulnerability, I want to talk a little bit about cold fusion variables and variable scopes. So cold fusion stores its variables um, in, in scopes, which is basically just the context that they exist. And so um, there's a, a bunch of predefined uh, built-in scopes in cold fusion. So your application scope contains a bunch of variables about your application. Your, your session scope uh, may contain variables about a logged in user or basically anything about the, the user's session state. Uh, you have variable scopes like URL and form that contain uh, all of your URL parameters or all of your form data. Um, and beyond that, beyond the, the built-in scopes, you can create custom scopes as well. So um, uh, custom code can, can create scopes and store variables in there. Um, by design, it's, it's well known that the user can control a lot of these scopes. Things like the URL scope and the form scope are, are documented sources of, of untrusted inputs. So uh, before you use them, uh, developers know you need to check these, and, and these are unsafe, these are tainted. Um, but mass assignment would give an attacker uh, control over any scope, even the ones that they, they shouldn't be able to directly control. Okay, so let's, let's look at our, our example uh, for uh, a possible mass assignment vulnerability. And so again, uh, we have a, a remote cold fusion component, and in here we're doing some kind of security check based on uh, one of our variables in a protected scope. So in, in this case, we're checking to see what is the application environment. If it's production, we're going to do something else. If it's dev, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll take a different path. So we'll, we'll show debug output or something else will happen. Um, and so the, the mass assignment vulnerability here was that in our argument collection, we could pass uh, any scope and any value uh, and then control uh, that particular variable. Uh, there were some limitations. It, it only applied to code within uh, remote cold fusion functions. Uh, so uh, if you were uh, using this kind of logic elsewhere in, in static CFML pages uh, or outside of remote components, uh, it wouldn't be exploitable. Um, but for, again, for your, your API-like remote cold fusion components, um, this mass assignment vulnerability would be exploitable. Uh, the Adobe patch uh, protects all of the built-in scopes, so things like your session scope and your application scope are all protected. Uh, but if you do have code like this where you're using custom scopes uh, in remote code fusion components, uh, an attacker could still potentially control those. And in, in that case, you're, you're going to want to validate what's coming in through uh, the parameters and arguments and uh, make sure that uh, an attacker uh, isn't able to, to control them. Uh, again, yeah, takeaways here, uh, pretty, pretty similar. Uh, uh, if we can avoid remote cold fusion components, that's going to give us a lot of uh, protection right off the bat. And from an exploitation standpoint, a lot of times you just need access to, to one single CFC file to carry out a lot of these attacks. Um, Finally, the, the last uh, attack surface category I want to talk about is uh, server-side request forgery. So again, common web application flaw uh, lets an attacker make uh, web requests from the context of the web application environment, basically turns the application server into uh, the attacker's web browser, and uh, it's caused by failing to, to validate input that flows into uh, vulnerable functions or, or functions that are making outbound web requests or outbound uh, network requests. And so as it relates to cold fusion, 
uh, a while back I was looking at some cold fusion documentation and for, for a particular function it, it caught my eye that uh, a parameter that, that a lot of functions could take could be either a file, so a file path or a file object or a, a, a URL. And, and so for, for something like this, for this kind of function, there was no uh, uh, switch, there was no, no check to see am I consuming a file object or am I consuming a file path? And so um, this made me think could be a common pitfall for developers if they're calling one of these functions that do take uh, file paths and file objects, uh, they, they may set themselves up. Um, and so for, for this example here, if we pass in a URL uh, in our file parameter instead of a file object, that function is going to go out and, and fetch that URL. Um, and so the, the root cause here is that a lot of these functions use um, the Apache virtual file system uh, to consume and process their, their arguments. Um, and there's, there's lots of cold fusion tags and lots of cold fusion functions that, that work this way. And compared to some other languages, so like PHP I know has a, an allow URL f open parameter that lets uh, developers globally turn this kind of functionality off and on. Uh, cold fusion, at least uh, as of the time that, that I reported this, didn't really have an, an easy way. Uh, there was uh, some, some manually intensive ways where you could uh, unzip a, a jar file and modify an XML file and kind of put it all back together and, and, and hope that it would work. But there was no like easy toggle switch to, to turn this functionality off or on. Um, and, and so when, when I found the first example of this, I, I went through and wrote a bunch of fuzzing test cases for a bunch of tags and a bunch of functions. Uh, passed in URLs, listened for callbacks, and, and identified a bunch of tags and a bunch of functions uh, that could be potentially vulnerable here. Um, I will call out that some of these are marked with an asterisk. Uh, those are tags or functions that are only vulnerable uh, in the open source uh, Lucy CFML engine and not Adobe Cold Fusion, uh, but there is some overlap between the two in terms of, of tags and functions that are uh, vulnerable. Uh, and then I have more detail and, and full list and, and uh, uh, additional information at the uh, URL there. Uh, and so again, uh, the takeaway here is that um, these tags and functions specifically should make sure that there, there's something that during your code review process or your uh, 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 static analysis, you're, you're looking for these, you're checking for these, you're saying, is tainted data flowing into them? Um, and then beyond that, from a, a proactive way, uh, network egress filtering can be a huge help here because if you had exploitable code but the attacker isn't able to call, back, call out, uh, you may uh, detect or prevent or uh, otherwise become aware of, of that vulnerability before any damage is done. Uh, on the offensive side, uh, it's really no different than any other kind of uh, server-side request forgery scanning. So you use something like Burp uh, Collaborator, throw out a bunch of URLs in uh, parameters, listen for callbacks, and whether it's cold fusion, whether it's, it's because of these tags or functions, or whether it's something else, you'll, you'll find your uh, server-side request for forgery vulnerabilities that way. And then from there, take that simple callback into something more uh, high impact. Uh, so yeah, as, as we kind of wrap it up, um, these vulnerabilities a lot of times can, can fit together and get chained together into high impact uh, vulnerabilities. So we may be able to take a server side request for vulnerability, use it to access uh, Cold Fusion Administrator, uh, and then do something bad from there. Or we may find one of these Cold Fusion Administrator uh, access control bypass vulnerabilities and then chain that with a way to reach and then exploit um, one of those more serious uh, critical uh, vulnerabilities that relied on remote CFCs and, and remote uh, methods. Uh, if you're in a position where you need to protect Cold Fusion, uh, just a, a couple of handy things to do. Uh, patch is probably the most important. Uh, having looked at a lot of Cold Fusion systems, it's very, very hard to fully secure them if they're not up to date. Um, uh, Cold Fusion has a lockdown tool and lockdown settings uh, 
that will do uh, a lot of hardening right off the bat, highly recommended. Uh, Cold Fusion has a, a sandbox tool that is built on the Java security sandbox and can do things like uh, restrict network access, restrict file access, uh, enable and disable specific tags and functions, uh, can certainly lock things down too. Um, and again, we've, we, we've talked about access control, we've talked about uh, WAF rules uh, and, and things like that. Uh, and then finally, kind of sometimes if, if uh, everything else fails, uh, endpoint detection, host detection may also give you some level of, of alerting uh, if something is actually uh, compromised, uh, either as a, a secondary or tertiary uh, indicator before things get even worse. Um, a couple of final closing thoughts. Uh, I also want to add that as a researcher, Adobe has been a great company to, to uh, report things to. They've been easy to work with. They've been timely. Um, uh, so highly recommended there. Um, I'll also say that, that more recently, Cold Fusion, some of the, the recent security updates have included breaking changes in the name of security. Uh, so uh, there have been things like uh, changing some, some defaults, uh, default parameters, uh, default encryption algorithms, uh, turning off uh, uh, support for how some variable resolution work that are definitely going to break legacy applications, but make the, the Cold Fusion environment uh, much more secure from, uh, from kind of square one. Uh, so that, that's, that's definitely a positive sign. Uh, and then also Cold Fusion, or I'm sorry, Adobe recently uh, transformed their vulnerability disclosure program uh, for Cold Fusion and a bunch of other products into a paid bug bounty. Uh, so again, kudos to uh, Adobe for continuing to, to support and facilitate uh, security research. Uh, that is what I have. Uh, here's my contact information. Feel free to hit me up after the talk. And uh, thank you very much. I think we have uh, two minutes, so I'm happy to take questions. And otherwise, uh, enjoy what's left of, of uh, B-Sides. <laughs>